I'm the content co-chair at the Expo this year, and I'm excited to introduce the first ever DeFi session we've held at, at this conference. Yeah. We'll cover everything from real-world assets to on-chain market making, stable coins, smart contracts on Bitcoin, and much more. There'll also be another DeFi session tomorrow. The session will be moderated by Sam Broner, a first-year MBA student at MIT and the incoming blockchain president at Sloan. Most recently, Sam has been working on Project Hamilton at the Boston Fed and is headed to Andreessen's crypto team this summer. Fantastic. Thanks for the introduction. I'm not going to waste too much time introducing you all myself. I'll let you guys do that. But uh, suffice it to say, it's extremely exciting that we have our first DeFi panel at the Bitcoin Expo. It's been a relevant topic for years, and it's about time. So thank you all for coming. Let's get started. I'll take a seat now. Um, if we could just go down the line, you guys could tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now, maybe where you're from, like one sentence on that, and then uh, tell me and the crowd here why you care about the DeFi space, what inspired you to join. So TJ, we can start with you. Sure. Is this guy on? Yeah. Uh, my name is TJ Ragsdale. Um, I'm on the real world finance team at MakerDAO, which is a permissionless lending protocol on Ethereum. Um, my background is in TradFi. I used to trade real estate bonds. Um, and what I'm working on is really taking real world assets uh, that exist in the real world, so bonds, equities, real estate, renewable energy projects, and the debt associated, and find a way to bring them on chain into the world that we're all familiar and fond of. Um, I guess I'm passionate about DeFi because uh, it gives folks that previously wouldn't have had access to capital and capital markets that access. Thanks, TJ. So, hi everyone. I'm Pei. Um, I'm currently head of growth at IOV Labs, which is the creator of RSK, a sidechain project on a smart contract platform on Bitcoin. Um, I was I joined the crypto space back in 2017. And it's been a really fun journey. I did um, things anywhere from launching a tokenization platform and um, selling DeFi to institutions back in 2019 through 2020 um, at Consensus, and then tried to wrap my head around uh, enterprise blockchain um, by creating a business dev team at Digital Asset, and then um, to currently joining the Bitcoin side of the ecosystem, um, shaping the narrative of DeFi on Bitcoin. So. Very excited about this conversation today. I guess um, the reason I care about DeFi, I think one of the biggest motivation for me to join my current company is also the idea of um, making DeFi inclusive and the future of finance uh, should be not just about trading and generating yield, but also including the world population. So I think there's a greater impact, impact of DeFi in that context. Cool, thanks. Uh, my name is David. I work in business development at Wintermute, uh, one of the world's leading crypto market makers, OTC providers, and we do venture as well. Uh, so if we can help with any of those things, feel free to reach out after. Background, I went to MIT Sloan, graduated in 2019. Any Sloanies in the house? Yeah, all right, what's up? Um, right after Sloan, went to Bridgewater, uh, working with institutional clients and prospects. Got into crypto in 2020, working at Floating Point Group, an MIT-founded startup, and uh, joined Wintermute earlier this year. Uh, live currently in the area also, so uh, born and bred here. What excites me about DeFi really is the opportunity to do things differently, to do things more efficiently, to save time and money with all sorts of financial services and applications that we're used to doing in a slow, costly way. So that really encompasses a broad range of use cases that we're just touching the surface of right now and excited to dive into it deeper on the panel. Hi, I'm Marco Di Maggio. I'm a professor of finance at Harvard Business School. Please don't boo Harvard. Um, I'm also the director of the Harvard Club on um, FinTech, Crypto, and Web3. And I've been uh, uh, collaborating with a number of different uh, DeFi uh, protocols, so starting with the Terra since 2018. We brought the white paper together, Anchor, Mirror, and then now in another stablecoin, Sperax, uh, plus uh, as an advisory board at uh, Coinbase. Particularly excited about DeFi because you can, I cannot have a more traditional background in finance, and I see everything that the that DeFi means in terms of innovation and improvements on top of CeFi. Looking forward to this. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, 
some new people are in the room, I just want to say one more time, thank you so much for joining us. It's a fabulous panel to have kick off the first ever DeFi event at the Bitcoin Expo. So let's go back to you, Marco. I, um, I'm curious, just because not everyone here is as experienced in the DeFi realm, if you could just give an overview as a professor at HBS, uh, what about DeFi is an improvement on centralized finance? Okay, so I think there are two ways of thinking about DeFi. There is a narrow way and a broader way. So the narrow way looks at DeFi as an improvement of CeFi on a number of different dimensions. The first one is efficiency. If, you know, we are already, you know, we are you know, now thinking that uh, everything is normal, uh, given the financial markets that we have right now, but you know, thinking about that it costs two, three percent to have a credit card transaction, so that it takes two days to have uh, a, a stock transaction settle, or that cross-border payments are so costly. And DeFi sort of solves all of these, uh, all of these issues, uh, partly because it's putting, rather than a, a financial intermediary in the middle, it's putting a smart contract in the middle. And so having both a combination of a better technology st stack, which is more efficient, as well as giving up the oligopoly of financial intermediaries, they are able to offer transactions at a much cheaper and uh, you know, lower cost overall. Then there is also a, a, an improvement in terms of transparency. Everybody can look and see, have visibility in terms of what type of transactions uh, they are uh, engaging in. There are no back deals uh, among uh, brokers or central intermediaries. And then there is this vision about uh, offering uh, financial, uh, better financial inclusion overall. If you think about there are 1.7 billion people around the world that have a smartphone but don't really have access to financial services provided by traditional institutions. While DeFi offers that opportunity by just giving the opportunity to whoever has a Wi-Fi and a, and a smartphone. I think that's sort of the narrow view and has already achieved a lot. And then there is a broader view that looks at DeFi as potentially not only just improvements, but a real complement or even uh, superseding some of uh, the financial services that are offered uh, in CFI. And I think that's mainly when you think about um, AMM, for instance. Uh, thinking about automatic market makers and the way in which transactions uh, are happening there is a significant improvement with respect to whatever is happening in CFI right now. And one can, it doesn't really need a lot of imagination to think that that can be adopted uh, in, for instance, for exchange transactions. And so having a world where the two are blended and DeFi is then becoming a, a better and better tool and is taking a, a significant larger role in CFI, I think it's totally conceivable. I think the point that uh, you know, just to be fair, on the DeFi side, the, the point that is still not achieved fully, I think is coming out of the crypto native uh, ecosystem. Right? So really making this accessible to people that, are, that have not been born and raised in crypto, I think is still very much a vision. And I think that's a combination of education, uh, regulation, and probably UI. Education because you need to be educated uh, as of now to interface with many of the protocols out there. Regulation, because there are many use, potential users that are on the sidelines and think that uh, this is way too risky still to enter. And then the UI, because they, I think we can still learn a little bit from Web2 to make a UIs that are helpful and are bringing users uh, into the space. It's fabulous. Great insight. Well, you mentioned market makers, and I just do want to highlight one of the issues that's been particularly prominent in DeFi, but it's also a problem in centralized finance as well. David, can you talk about Wintermead's role in the DeFi space and uh, how you think about you, how you can improve the DeFi world? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, want to dive into that. Just want to talk about the high-level idea of DeFi for just a moment um, and unpack it. So what is DeFi? It's decentralized finance. Um, what is finance? I had an amazing professor here, Adrian Vertelhan. If any of you guys are at MIT, take his class. He said finance is just moving value across space and time. That's it. There's more complicated ways to do it, but that's all it is at its core. What's decentralized? Well, it's actually defined by what it's not. It means that you're not relying on a centralized entity. You're doing it in a way that just doesn't rely on it. So that's what DeFi is. It's very simple at its core. And I think that um, you know, the most actually basic example of DeFi, I think, actually is Bitcoin, moving value across countries, across different parts of the world without a Western Union in, in the middle. Um, and as we're building out more and more things with lending, borrowing, um, you know, staking, liquidity providing, um, the more sophisticated versions of the same concept. So when we think about Wintermute and our role in DeFi, we want to be there for the financial innovation that's happening without a centralized intermediary in the middle. 
So that could be around a new protocol, a new project that enables individuals to provide liquidity, ind individuals to be the provider of what is what used to be a centralized exchange. Um, it could be trading on a new DEX, on a new decentralized exchange. It could be lending or borrowing from one of these new decentralized exchanges. And the way that we're active on DeFi is we integrate our broader market making trading strategies, our high frequency trading strategies on chain across DeFi, on Ethereum, on Solana, on other chains. And that helps in two ways. One, it helps by actually bringing volume there. And the other way it helps is by pro proving val validity, by basically um, liquidity is something that I think we should dive into deeper, but like the key problem in any market, especially DeFi, is liquidity. If there's not buyers and sellers, no one's going to do anything. So our role at Wintermute is we want to find the best projects. We, we want to provide that liquidity early. And then, like Marco was saying, we want a broader universe of people to come on board to use that too. Um, and the end result will be something that's more efficient, saves money, or produces money for the participants involved. Fabulous. TJ, you work for MakerDAO. I feel like you were doing some of the best work bringing real world assets on chain. I wonder if you could sort of tag that, both explain what MakerDAO is, what your purpose is, and then some about the, the work you're doing bringing these assets on chain. Sure, so um, as mentioned, so MakerDAO is a sort of a, a lending protocol that allows users to lend to themselves, right? Again, there's no central intermediary. Anyone with an Ethereum wallet anywhere on earth, Wi-Fi and a smartphone, who has eligible collateral, so that's you know wrapped Bitcoin or Ethereum or a few others, can lock up that collateral and, and borrow against it. And I think um, even in the States, that's not all that powerful, right? Because our existing financial infrastructure is quite strong. People can access credit. Um, the US government's fairly predictable. You know, borrowing dollars is not difficult for any of us in this room. But if you're part of sort of a you know a more complicated volatile regime like Venezuela or Argentina and you had this Ethereum and it was in your wallet and you could lock it up and borrow dollars against it or die, that's pretty powerful, right? Um, and I think that's really kind of the, um, the power of DeFi, giving anyone access to capital markets anywhere on earth. Um, with regards to real world assets, um, when you think about kind of what Maker is, um, it allows people to borrow die against collateral, right? Um, but when all the collateral is crypto native, it all moves down and moves up in parallel, right? Which is sort of a weakness in a way, crypto is very volatile. So what if we could also bring uncorrelated assets into the collateral base for MakerDAO? So what my team is trying to build out is bringing these real world assets, which all of us are very familiar with, equities, bonds, real estate, et cetera, into DeFi and allow um, asset managers in the real world to borrow DAI, synthetic dollars, against those real world assets. Fabulous. The, sort of going around the panel here, sort of getting everyone oriented, but pay, you work on RSK, you work at IOV Labs, you do growth there. When we look at DeFi, we're seeing a lot of action on Ethereum, but I'm just wondering if you could share the, the bull case for building smart contracts on RSK and a little bit about why you think that we should move more DeFi to, to the RSK protocol. I think um, it's a, you know, think about DeFi on Bitcoin is not a very intuitive, but if you really think about it, Bitcoin is actually the very first DeFi application, right? And the reason, um, before DeFi became a thing, so the, the term of DeFi really came into full focus back in 2019 within the Ethereum ecosystem, and because of smart contract capabilities, become, because of the ERC token standards that made it possible and the invention of stable coins. So all of that made Ethereum have the very early mover advantage but that, that is changing today. Uh, is, if you think, if you look around, there are many um, layer twos and sidechain projects are being developed on Bitcoin today. RSK is one of the oldest uh, sidechain platform on Bitcoin and it is EVM compatible. Um, so if you call Solidity, if you've de deployed the application on Ethereum, you can easily pour it over. And build applications and use cases, as David mentioned, lending and borrowing, liquidity, staking, and you can do stablecoin, minting, and all of that. And um, we even have an integration with DAO. There's uh, RDAI. I don't know if you heard of that. Um, the founders of RSK um, are from emerging markets, Argentina, right? A bunch of Argentinians and um, the come from the countries where really non-speculative use cases are needed came together and 
um, thought, why don't we marry the advantage of Ethereum and the Bitcoin as the most secure settlement layer together and create a platform that can enable the world um, open finance accessible economy. So I think I would say that look around, you also can say that the currently most of the DeFi value is dominated in Bitcoin. There are over 28,000 wrapped Bitcoin. Um, I think over 3,000 or so, um, 7,000 or so uh, ren are uh, BTC on Ethereum. There's over 3,000 Bitcoin on our uh, RSK and the list goes on. So that becomes a um, economy of over $11 billion, even giving the the market today, it's a little bit down right now. So all the value of DeFi is already based on Bitcoin. I think the question we want to ask then is, it's secure, um, but is it scalable? Is it fast enough? Do we have enough developer community to support the development of a world economy, the DeFi economy, um, in the next few years? I think the trend is very clear. The momentum is shaping, and we're seeing more and more interest coming from all different directions, both from the uh, capital market side, develop, developer side, um, academ academias, and everybody's looking into it. And I think uh, just echoing what Mark said before, the inclusion of finance is super important as well. And that's an, an ETHO that's reflected a lot in the Bitcoin community, if you think about it. The adoption around the world, if you look at the list, the top 10 are in Southeast Asia, it's in Latin America, it's, it's, it's not in the first world economy, right? But that's what's exciting about this economy. I think, you know, after the uh, DeFi summer, uh, now I think we're gonna see a sharp pivot and we're gonna see very interesting stuff happening that will redefine what DeFi really is. And that I, in that vision, I really see Bitcoin as a key pillar of it. Hey, one of the things that's sort of implicit in, in your responses now is the importance of interoperability within, within the DeFi world. You are building a, you know, smart contracts into, into Bitcoin. How have you emphasized and incentivized interoperability in, in your ecosystem? So yeah, I, I think um, it's, uh, we're still at the place, I feel like there's a lot of hand-holding required, even though it's uh, EVM compatible, it's very uh, deployable, redeployable on RSK, but we, we just have to make sure that we make it very easy for developers, right? Like the open source component of it was um, what made Ethereum so successful. Um, I think the uh, developer tooling is super important and having that kind of like post-launch support um, is also equally important. And then, and then to David's point, like liquidity is, is also a key, key thing to make any ecosystem sustainable and attractive. So um, we, as a company um, yeah. and the platform, we, we support our protocols in all directions. Like Sovereign was uh, the, the biggest lending and borrowing protocol on, um, on RSK. And we were right there with them, you know, every step of the way, helping them uh, develop the platform, help them launch and have become the biggest user on the platform. And also we do ecosystem work together. So we're pretty much like a, a small but nice family kind of vibe. And same thing with, you know, Money on Chain. It's a stable coin platform or RSK. And I think stable coin is super um, critical for uh, um, a platform like Bitcoin because that's essentially what makes the uh, use cases, a lot of use cases possible. Without a stable coin um, layer, then you can really provide that stability that Bitcoin wasn't really well known for, right? So um, I think we're trying to create a very tight but viable, uh, we call it a minimal viable economy on our scale, which includes the lending borrowing, includes the stable coin com component, there's the liquidity and trading platform, and then there's the aggregation of you know, all the economies. So, we're, we're getting there a step away. So. Yeah. Let's go a step further on the, the stablecoin concept. I'm curious, this is for anyone who'd like to take it, but what does winning look like in the stablecoin world? What's the end state in five years? What does it look like if we have a real universal adoption of, of stablecoins and even further growth? Yeah, I can start. Um, I, uh, winning, I, I think there will be a concept of winning relatively, just like, you know, the US dollar is a reserve currency, but, um, you know, yen and euro are still powerful, right? Um, but ultimately, I think sort of as David alluded to, uh, liquidity is king. So, um, 
you know, I think what a successful stable coin looks like um, is something that is ultra liquid, there's low slippage, everyone wants to use it and everyone wants to hold it, sort of like the dollar, right? The dollar is dominant in central bank reserves because it has certain fundamental properties that are simply better. Um, I think a winning stable coin, to the extent there is a winner, uh, mirrors those fundamentals. But ultimately what you want, I think, for this entire ecosystem to be successful is um, sort of fungibility amongst stables, right? We have some centralized stable coins, we have some more decentralized stable coins. I think what you really want is you want one-to-one -one swappability across the ecosystem so people, users, developers, institutions can move flawlessly across the entire thing. I think that when that occurs, we'll have victory as sort of a, a, a system, but again, to me, it's all about liquidity. Marco, are you in Sure. In yeah, so uh, I totally agree with DJ point about uh, um, sort of the, the adoption. I think that on top of that, I, th I think we have to put this into context of the regulatory challenges as well. And I think that regulators like to regulate by assimilation. And so if you think about stable coins, the way in which they work, I get the reserves or the collateral and then I issue something that should be stable. That's extremely similar to the money market fund. And money market funds are uh, extremely regulated in the US. They have to keep uh, reserves uh, that are uh, very liquid. They have to offer full vis vis visibility and transparency into the reserves that they are using and offer a stable NAV. Um, I think that's sort of where they are going, uh, also in terms of the first step, because the stable coins is very much the first entry for everybody. You open a Coinbase account and then you swap fiat for stable coins. And so that's going to be the first thing uh, that is going to be regulated, that's my guess. And so I think that winning uh, is coming up with a framework or a, that is compliant, and so it can be adopt, fully adopted by both institutions as well as retail across the board. Then I think on top of that, uh, there is also one extra element, which is thinking about whether we can take advantage of the fact that stable coins are the first point of entry. And so offering the stable, stable coins that themselves offer additional services or uh, are sort of um, improving on the interface with the, with the end users, I think that's also, I think, one step forward. That's what, for instance, Sperax does, which is a auto yielding. So you just own the stable coin and you get paid uh, the yields because they Gets the, the collateral gets invested uh, in, uh, in Curve and gets passed on to the users directly. I think that's just a way of getting closer to the vision of financial inclusion for the non-crypto native. And I think then, obviously, there is the, the risk associated with all of this that is related to uh, with the regulation as well. And so there is a world where decentralization and being more and more decentralized is going to be the answer to many of these of these questions. And I think that's sort of the stable coins 2.0 that I think that's where uh, they are pushing forward. Thank you. The, it, and it brings up a good point around just stable coins and adoption generally. Adoption and growth are two of the most important words in DeFi. I mean, it's in every single conversation. Maybe we start with you, Pay, but I'm curious, when you think about adoption, are you thinking about end users? Are you thinking about institutional investment? Are you thinking about developers? Or is it just as simple as, as brand name and name recognition? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so the first thing I did after I joined uh, my current company at um, IOB Labs, RSK, is to um, take a very deep look into our ecosystem and then cut that, divide that into five different categories, which is the, the operator who helps secure the network. That's like the mining pools who merge mine with RSK. That's node operators, pagnotories, right? And there's the um, concept of uh, uh, partners who are the protocols and dApps uh, that are current, uh, are building on RSK or will be building on RSK. That's, integrating um, RSK using the building blocks that we provide. And then there's the enabler session, which is like all the wallets of the world. Liquidity provided by accessibility to exchanges and those critical integration that can actually make the adoption easier for the partners and the partners um, and users. So the next category obviously is the end users. But on top of all of that, there's also a um, ecosystem actor called um, community. And community is very complex and the very layered, it's a layered actor um, category because that includes the, the funds, the capital markets, that includes the developer, the technical audience who are going to come and join the, the ecosystem, right? So the adoption is about, you know, in order to actually have a full-on adoption and make a um, sustainable process, it needs to, every cog of that machine needs to work and work together well. Um, and with the, with the end user being the ultimate goal. So I think 
you know, the end user should be day-to-day -day ordinary Joe who wanted to get into crypto without losing their shirt, right? So how do we make that possible? And that goes back to stablecoin probably being the gateway drug and being the first point of entry would make a lot of sense. Um, but the success of adoption for stablecoin, for instance, is you know, users shouldn't have to worry about the complexity of um, getting on the digital crypto rail. So if it's hidden, then it makes it much easier for new banks and the Web3 companies to come and, and bring it to the, the public in a really meaningful way and the, and the organic way, right? So I think, you know, the successful, um, I mean, there are two folds about the de definition of a successful stablecoin strategy. I think one is the, you know, to be a successful stablecoin strategy means that you have a successful yield strategy, that you present um, attractive liquidity, um, the total value locked in, the token itself. But there's also another um, aspect of it, right? That means like, you know, the user experience, the user UX is excellent, and the user, the payment experience is flawless. So I think that's, and also you can actually go to anywhere in the world, like Africa, for instance, and without the you know, infrastructure, financial access to a bank account, so you can get on and adopt stablecoin just with a click at a fingertip. Yeah. That's a helpful lens to look at. I'm curious to move back to you, Marco. You spent a lot of time on tokenomic design. Just a couple sentences on, on what tokenomics are for those who have not spent enough time on that, but then also how does tokenomic incentives lead to adoption, and, and how do you think about that in your work? Yeah, sure. So tokenomics is very much uh, a combination of finance, uh, game theory, and marketing uh, to think about, to, to build a framework of incentives to incentivize, for instance, uh, users to provide liquidity or to adopt uh, a particular token. And overall, also making very transparent the way in which uh, capital flows, in the way in which, for instance, fees flows to the value of the token. And I think there are examples where this has been extremely successful, an example where a wrong tokenomic sort of brought down the whole house either because it's not sustainable or because it's not transparent, so people don't really feel why the token should have any value to begin with. I think one point, uh, given, the, given the time that I want to focus on it, building on uh, on pace point here, which is uh, liquidity. I think one issue with the DeFi uh, has been liquidity, which is very mercenary. And if you think about the, the, the CFI, that's a, one of the biggest difference. The big advantage of banks is because they have deposits, and deposits are extremely sticky. There is no way in which Bank of America is going to convince deposits to fly to their accounts by just increasing the yields of few basis points. In DeFi, instead, this capital flow around quite a bit. And I think that sort of it creates a risk for not only stable coins that needs that liquidity. You know, my benchmark is you need to have at least $100 million of liquidity so that you can make, you can do those swaps with the close to zero slippage, uh, but also for any other protocol that needs liquidity to, to function. So how do you make those sticky? The reaction so far has been very, I think, uh, uh, very, sort of um, very brute force, which is I pay. And so this has become sort of customer acquisition cost has been huge in DeFi. And if you think about the Uber of this world, uh, that's exactly what, uh, what has created, has destroyed value for, uh, for Uber. The fact that paying the drivers uh, was extremely costly and they make no profit. I think we are making uh, that mistake again by just uh, paying for this liquidity on a continuous basis and not finding a way to make it as sticky as possible. Do I have an answer? No. Do I think that Olympus DAO is the clear answer? Uh, maybe not, but I like the concept of uh, owning rather than renting the liquidity. I think that's extremely powerful. And making sure that uh, the liquidity providers are staying with you both in normal times and then when uh, bad things happen. And bad things in crypto happens all the time. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for inviting at least a small amount of drama into the discussion. <laughs> and we can, uh, David, uh, talk to you. You guys are liquidity makers. Yeah. You're on the other side of this. And first, if you could just tell everyone a little about what it literally looks like for you to go up to a DAO and say, hey, we're, we're gonna try to make liquidity around your, your token. Just like to choose one example. Uh, and then we can talk about your perspective on, on what you know, value you bring to the community and why you offer a, a benefit. Yeah. yeah, sure. So I guess first, like the way to think about it at the highest level is we're trading across CFI and DeFi in one integrated system, right? So we're market making. We're essentially providing liquidity, ensuring that there's um, orders of buying and selling across all the venues that we're integrated with. 
Um, so first, we're just going to figure out where there is an opportunity to do that, where there is an arbitrage, where there is a price difference, and that's where we're going to trade. And we're going to do that all day, every day, billions of dollars a day, algorithmically high-frequency trading. Um, and what's unique about what we do is that DeFi is integrated with it. When we think about providing liquidity, bootstrapping liquidity, you know, maybe there's a, a project, maybe it's a DEX on a, you know, a chain or a lending borrowing protocol that needs some initial liquidity, needs some initial activity to bootstrap and get more activity there. Maybe we're investing in it, maybe we're market making for it, maybe we just think that there's a need for that project to exist. In those situations, we'll be there and actually use our capital to provide liquidity to bootstrap that project. David, what, what does that look like? So I'm going to a DEX and I'm literally just mm -hmm. not finding the asset that I want to purchase? Mm -hmm. um, well, what it looks like is that, let's say there's an asset that's trading on a DEX and trading on CFI. Um, we will both buy and sell across CFI and DeFi for that particular asset, right? So we're, we're basically um, integrating the um, pricing of that DEX into our broader market neutral market making strategy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but I also want to go back to sort of this like story of adoption because I think it's a really good one and I think it's a really interesting one. I mean, if you think about DeFi and where it's been, a little over a year ago, we had $1 billion in total value locked. That's essentially the amount of assets that were locked in smart contracts across DeFi. Today, I think as of this morning, we're around 205 billion. So that's a huge growth story, a huge trajectory. Um, so like first, like pat on everyone's backs, whoever's been involved in DeFi, like that's incredible, right? Um, but then like, when you wanna think about where the future's going and how we're gonna get more people on board, I think there's two layers to think about it. There's the institutional and there's the retail, and both are really important. On the retail side, I think the user experience has to be a lot better. It has to feel more secure, it has to feel more accessible, and people just have to practice with it. Like you just have to get used to trusting a trustless protocol in a sense, right? I mean, you're not really trusting, you're, in a sense you are, the risk is smart contract um, hacking risk, but you, you have to just get used to that and get more people used to that, that's one thing. Um, on the institutional side, there's all sorts of compliance and regulatory issues, but there's people that are solving for it. There's projects like Ave Arc and Maple that have KYC pools that you can lend and borrow from. And the issue around institutions is they want to make sure that they're not interacting with a bad actor. So they might still want the benefits of DeFi, the yields on DeFi, but they just have to make sure that they're not interacting with you know, a terrorist or a country that's sanctioned. So there are solutions for that as well. Um, but I also think we don't need to get too institution obsessed. Right? What are institutions? They're just a bunch of accounts of a bunch of individuals that a centralized entity controls, right? So like, let's not forget why we built this in the first place, right? These pension funds that are individual retirement accounts of teachers, firefighters, whatever. Let's figure out ways to give those people access that doesn't rely on those heavy institutions. It doesn't rely on those you know, huge teams of thousands of people that you know, maybe don't need to be compensated for what they're doing because there's a more efficient smart contract way to do it. It's a fantastic transition. A couple of people on the panel have spent time in centralized finance institutions, and it's a very different way of working. You're in a, you know, a private room. You're not having your, your chat broadcast to the world to see. TJ, you're at MakerDAO. You guys are doing this better than anyone else. What's it like to work out in the open as you are? Um, well, first of all, it's shocking to hear you say we're doing it better than everyone else. <laughs> it doesn't feel like that. Um, no, it's pretty, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty fantastic. So what I would say is, um, you know, Maker obviously sort of prides itself on being maximally decentralized. And that's at the protocol layer, you know, how the protocol is literally constructed all the way to the governance layer, right? And I think the trade-off you're basically making is decentralized systems are more resilient um, and you're giving up efficiency often, right? Like it's much more difficult to do things in a ledger that you can't control because you have to come to consensus across many thousands of machines, right? So you're getting this sense of resilience and the ability to hedge against kind of corruption or power plays in governance or at the protocol layer, which can be very, very powerful, right? But the trick is crypto is extremely adversarial, right? Everyone is here trying to innovate very quickly. Everyone's moving very quickly, right? It's kind of our Darwinian system. And so this resilience is great, but if you can't move quickly, right, you're losing the ability to make moves and adapt to certain conditions. And so I think what's really powerful about, about Maker is you have this kind of core protocol at the bottom layer, and no one can touch that, right? Anyone Earth on Earth is going to continue to be able to lock up ETH or WBTC and borrow against it. But then up here at the top is kind of the growth layer, right? The bedrock stays the same. But at the top, you want to have the ability to move quickly. And so I think one of the things we're working through is how do we ensure that we maintain that resilience of decentralized systems 
while also giving ourselves enough dynamism, you know, at the top layer where you need to move, to be able to respond to things as they change and keep up with competitors. So I would say, you know, CFI is, is, is fantastic insofar as you have an operator or a C-level that you believe in and that makes the right decisions. But it is vulnerable to certain um, warpage and, and corruption that DeFi is not. But if you have an ultra decentralized system, you're also moving slower. So I think it's just a trade off, and, and, and we're trying to work through how to best, best sculpture that. Yeah, it's interesting. For those of you who haven't done this, you can look up literally a proposal to, to a DAO very easily. And David, I'll send it back to you. But like if you, if you look up Wintermute, you guys did a deal with Index Co op. Like what, what was it like going from traditional biz dev to writing a post on a forum? Yeah, of course. Um, so first, I'd say um, I don't know if I worked at the most traditional um, <laughs> place. Um, I'm used to things being recorded at Bridgewater. Everything was recorded. Everything was transparent. Um, but I'd say in crypto and DeFi in particular, um, it's done in a much better way. And I think the key difference is actually around um, not just transparency, but hierarchy. I think in traditional finance, and maybe just a lot of traditional roles in general, there's a real emphasis on hierarchy, on seniority, on how many years you've been in a seat, giving you, um, you know, the ability to have authority on conversation. And in DeFi and crypto, you see that completely turned upside down. It's what you contribute, it's what you do. Offices are flat structures. You know, at Wintermute, I sit next to a co-founder and I just joined. I mean, th the idea that anyone can contribute based upon what they're able to bring to the table is a value that's actually realized in DeFi and actually realized in crypto, and I think that's pretty unique. Um, right, like I was just at a conference where there was a Solana developer that was 14 years old that was just like crushing it. And it's because the guy knows what he's doing and he's capable. So I think, to me, the key thing is it's kind of like removes hierarchy and um, prioritizes ability. As far as um, actually like being involved in governance, I think it's actually a really interesting idea. And at Wintermute, we just hired um, a DeFi envoy. His name is Colin, look him up. He is basically being active in governance across the different protocols, different, across different projects that we're involved with, trying to make proposals to make them better, trying to make proposals to make the liquidity stickier. Um, so it's not just mercenaries, so things are actually building for the long term. And what's cool is anyone in this room, if you take the time and effort, can be part of that too. It's fabulous. My mic, all right, good. Uh, the, we're, we're, we're somewhat nearing time here. This has been a super exciting conversation already. We're gonna begin to wrap with one question. As you sort of reflect on the last few months, can you list out one exciting protocol, tool, dApp that you've used in the last three to six weeks that folks here might not know about that they can go home tonight, play with, get informed on, maybe make some money with. TJ, maybe we could start with you? Sure, so I'm gonna just shill Maker real quick because I think <laughs> it's genuinely fantastic. Um, I think, think right now, right, especially as mortgage rates are rising, it's becoming more and more prohibitive to borrow against your physical property. At the same time as real world rates are rising, um, Maker rates are staying the same, right? So to the extent that anyone in this room has wrapped Bitcoin or Ethereum, you can go borrow at 2% against that. I mean, that, that's tremendous. So to leave Maker aside, um, one protocol I think is really neat that I don't use personally uh, is a protocol called Porter Finance. What this basically allows for is DAOs that generate revenue just like companies to effectively issue corporate bonds on chain. They're collateralized by the native token of that DAO and the responsibilities, the covenants of that bond are programmatically guaranteed by smart contracts, right? So you're, uh, you're de facto eliminating credit risk by building a corporate bond structure on chain. To me, that's kind of why we're here. That's a zero to one moment. I guess we're good on the line pay. Yeah, I think my answer will be obvious as well. You know, <laughs> check out RSK and uh, our uh, ecosystem and um, see what you're thinking. And I'm looking forward to hear some feedback. Um, and on the side note, and I'm surprised nobody talked about naming services yet. Like crazy things are happening at ENS, and uh, we have a product, RNS, which is about to take off, but you know, this is a primer, a little sneak peek of that and what's, uh, what's about to come, but uh, I feel like that's, uh, that's another critical component of a DeFi um, and decentralized economy is having that um, you know, non uh, censured, um, censored um, sanction, sorry, um, a naming uh, identity that can go across protocols, and so this is very exciting. So RNS, RSK. Could you just say one more word on like what, why you would need a naming service? Um, I feel like this, that, that, is the, that completes the, the puzzle, right? The, na the identity um, that native live on blockchain can cross the protocols and participating in different uh, DeFi ecosystems. Fabulous. David? 
Uh, cool. So I'll give a winter mute plug and then wait for you to make some money tonight. <laughs> um, you're all allowed to plug at least one time during the talk. So that, yeah, that's good, fun. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so winter mute plug, um, if you're looking to buy or sell, you know, the 250 tokens that we trade at scale, um, if you're a project that's building, you're looking for investment, you're looking for a market maker, or you just want to talk, um, reach out. Uh, my telegram is dmickley, D-M-I-C-L-E-Y. Just shoot me a message. Glad to talk. I work out of Kendall Square, so also glad to meet up for coffee or whatever for those that are local. Um, a way for you to make some money. Uh, it's a Bitcoin conference, so got to bring it back to Bitcoin. Um, block stacks. So there's a way for you to basically buy STX, which is the native token of block stacks, lock it up for around two weeks, and earn Bitcoin as your return. And that's pretty cool. That's actually kind of unique because a lot of these um, staking opportunities, you'll earn a similar asset or the same asset as your return. With block stacks, you earn Bitcoin in, as your return, um, which kind of diversifies your exposure. Because anytime you're staked, you're locked into that token, you're exposed to the price move of that token. Um, that's sort of the token that you're exposed to. And if that's a token you're also getting rewards, you have nothing to sort of uncorrelate that exposure. But with block stacks with STX, you get Bitcoin back, you have the STX exposure. Um, not investment advice, but check it out. <laughs> David, you are hired. <laughs> Marco, the same question to you. OK, so uh, the, the one that I, I like, that I think it's helpful uh, for people to really understand a couple of points that uh, came up. But once you have experience, you understand really and you appreciate it really this point. For instance, the interoperability or the issue about the liquidity. If you think about uh, the convex wars and sort of looking at uh, how you can uh, uh, provide liquidity, get V, CRV, and then get bribed to boost the rewards uh, of a particular pool, I think that puts together uh, how protocols build on, stack of each on top of each other, how potentially liquidity can be, uh, can be provided and can be rewarding, and at the same time, uh, how you as a liquidity provider can get on top of the liquidity fees, also bribes to boost the rewards. That's very much on the tokenomics uh, part of uh, all of this. The plug I will put at the end, which is there is going to be a curve pool with, uh, with uh, Sperax, so vote for us for the maximum rewards. Thank you. Well, this has been an unbelievable panel. If everyone here could join me for a round of applause for our wonderful audience. <laughs>